Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's good to see you on another Wednesday. Why don't you stand up on your feet? Say hello to the person next to you. So this is our last midweek in 2018. Our last midweek. And um, I got to tell you, I was thinking about this all last week. I have a bit of a, a working theory around Christmas music, okay? And I'll let you in on my theory. Christmas is all about Jesus, right? And a lot of the Christmas songs that we sing are all about Jesus. Worship songs are all about Jesus. So technically, every worship song is kind of a Christmas song. And that's just my way of saying, uh, please forgive us if we don't play all Christmas music this evening. We're gonna sing some songs, and I want you to come along with us. Before we do, let's pray together. Father, we love you. We lift up your name. And Jesus, we want nothing more than in this time to give you glory, to give you praise, for your name to be celebrated, to celebrate your kingship, to give you honor. And so I pray that in heaven you will receive our worship. God, that you would look into the heart of each person, that you would look into the mind of each person as you already know our story. Remind us that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. You long to see us and know us, and you want to be known by us. And so I pray that you would open your ears in heaven. God, I thank you that Zephaniah says that you are rejoicing over us with singing. And I pray that our offering will be acceptable in your sight. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name, come on. Better is one day in your court. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your court. Thousands elsewhere. Oh, come on, say. Better is one day in your court. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your court. Thousands come on, let's sing that again. Better is one day. Better is
elsewhere. Come on, sing that. Better is one day. Better is one day. Better is one day. Than thousands elsewhere.
it'll just be a hot moment. So, we're rounding out this uh, series that we've been in, midweek and the weekends, uh, all about the Holy Spirit and how he is present throughout the scriptures. And later on, Rick Schertz is going to come and give our final message uh, in this passage. Um, but for just, just a moment, I'd like to focus on, uh, again, the one that Christmas is all about. It's all about the Christ. And uh, just reading and getting prepared uh, for this week, I started to think of songs that focus on the kingship of Jesus. And it took me to a place of recognizing and remembering that the scriptures all point to the person of the Christ. You follow the narrative of the Hebrew people and it's all about the coming one, the coming Messiah, the one that would be king. And so as we prepare for this time in our service where we, where we receive from the Lord's table, we receive communion, we recognize Emmanuel, God with us. I love to read a few passages over us. And these passages are all about Jesus. And they range from the prophets to even after Jesus lived and uh, died and was buried and resurrected. So I'd love for you to just posture yourself to receive. Maybe close your eyes. Open your hands. If you're a person that kneels when you read or when you pray, take that posture if you would. But these words are about the one that we celebrate at Christmas time, the Christ. Isaiah 9, 7 says, There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The prophet Zechariah says, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshiped. Luke 1 32 says, the Lord God will give him as Jesus, the throne of his ancestor, David. And he will reign forever over Israel. His kingdom will never end. Hebrews 1 and 8 says, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. And Jesus, in this moment, we recognize your kingship. We recognize that you are high and lifted up. And I pray that as we worship, as we receive, as we commune with you now, God, that you would help to open up our understanding, open up our hearts and our minds to see what it is to crown you as Lord of all. To not just read it in the pages of the scriptures written thousands of years ago, but as the story of our lives has continued to be written, help us to crown you above everything in our lives crown you as Lord of our families, crown you as Lord of our, of our work, crown you as Lord of our ideals about what success is. God, help us to crown you as Lord over our agenda, our belief system, our faith, everything that involves us, we want to crown you as Lord above it all. for your help. So in a moment, we're going to start singing more songs about the name of Jesus. And I'd like to invite you to receive from the Lord's table as you feel ready.
What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name.
Jesus, we lift your name high. And not that you need human beings to do that in order for you to be God. But we recognize that it is our place under you to honor you as king. God, we thank you that you know our days. We thank you that you know what exists in our lives. God, you knew the day that each one of us had before we walked in. The good news that we would receive, the hard news that we would receive. You've seen it all. You are Emmanuel. You are God with us. Help us to believe that. And as we believe that you are with us, help us to crown you as Lord of everything in our lives. To crown you as Lord of everything that concerns us crown you as Lord above everything that we love. And we pray your strength in these moments. We celebrate you. It's our prayer with thanksgiving. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Hey, can we thank this worship team for leading us and just simply reminding us that there is nothing stronger, there's nothing bigger, or there's nothing more powerful than the name of Jesus. Do we believe that this evening? Amen. You can be seated. And service hosts, you can begin to receive our tithes and offering. All right, all right. Well, hey, what season is it? It's Christmas season. Who loves this time of the year? I do too. I'm looking out and I'm seeing some red, so I already see the festivities uh, already beginning in some people's hearts. Uh, well, as you guys know, uh, Christmas at Willow is going to be in a couple of weeks. It begins on, uh, I almost said January. Wow, I'm not ahead of time. It begins on December 22nd and goes to the 24th. There's six different worship experiences that we're going to be having, and I would love to invite you all to two things. Uh, the first is simply serving for Christmas at Willow. Um, there are going to be tens of thousands of people who come here over those three days and I want to make sure, and I'm sure every person wants to make sure that every single person who comes has a phenomenal experience, has a life-changing experience, and that can happen when we decide that we can serve together. So I would love to encourage you to sign up. You can go to www.willowcreek.org forward slash next steps about the different opportunities that we have uh, to serve. So I would love for you guys um, to check that out. And also, if you're not serving, well, after you serve, <laughs> you can actually come to one too. There, there are four, like I said, there's six different worship experiences that are happening. I um, would love to invite your friends, your family, even invite an enemy if you'd like as well too, uh, because guess what? Even your enemies need to hear the story of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So I'd love to just have those right there as well, too. Um, hey, this weekend, we're going to be wrapping up the series All Struck in the Weekend, and Matt Wright uh, is going to be finishing that up. Hey, uh, have you guys just enjoyed both the series of the weekend as well as it? It's been phenomenal. Albert Tate was here last week, and Albert Tate brought it. He did a fantastic job uh, as well, too. So I just love you guys to come on out this weekend, and you can experience that. And, hey, I have one more announcement. It's the midweek break. This week is the last midweek of 2018. That's really good. I like those odds. I like. Can we do a one collectively? One, two, three. That's so good, guys. So good. So good. Um, but hey, we will be back on January 9th. So hey, make sure you, on your Wednesday evening, spend some time with your family, spend some time with your friends. Um, we're gonna be having a great time. Like I said, uh, anybody going anywhere for Christmas or anything? Where are you going? Who's going the farthest? Yell it out. South Carolina. That's pretty far. Is that Ted? Okay, that's like Ted. <laughs> Oregon. Oh, what's further? Or Oregon's further than South Carolina, I think. Are oh, you driving to Oregon? Whoa. It's not crazy at all. <laughs> time of prayer. Can we have a time of prayer? You want to pray for her? We're going to pray for her at the end uh, for going to Oregon. Uh, we're going to pray that the Lord... With your daughter. We're going to pray for all of them as well. Because that's, it's like a day and a half or something like that. Three days. Man, it took Jesus three days to raise from the grave. Yeah. All right, all right. 
Well, hey, with that being said, we're going to segue to our next portion. If you have a class or workshop you're going to attend, we'd love to dismiss you at this time. And coming up tonight, batting cleanup for the very last midweek, we have the one and only Dr. Richard Charles Schertz. And it's his full name. So he's going to be up in just a few moments. And so until then, talk to somebody beside you. Tell them how wonderful they are. Thank you so much. I begin tonight with an image coming up on the screen behind me. In June 1989, it's nearly 30 years ago, some of you remember this moment, Tiananmen Square in China, an estimated one million students rose up in protest of their communist government. The students called for democracy, they called for freedom of speech, they called for freedom of the press, and the Chinese government, they cracked down on them in the darkest of ways. Soldiers opened fire with automatic weapons into the, into the protesters, and an unknown number were killed that day. To this day, we don't know the name of the man in the image. He's become known as Unknown Rebel. But on June 5th, he stood before this column of tanks. And when the tanks moved to the right, he stepped to his left and got in their way. Then the tanks swerved back to their left, and he stepped to his right and stood in their way again. Again, we don't know whatever happened to this man, but we do know that his act of defiance, it inspired the world, and it continued the movement. Now, as you look at the image, I'd ask that you consider a question. What does he see? What does he see? Now, obviously, he sees a column of tanks, but I want to see beyond that. In, in a bigger picture, a bigger view, what's his vision? What's he see that transcends that moment? What's he see that transcends the barrel of that gun staring down on his face? I'd suggest that he's looking beyond that tank. He's seeing something bigger, something more important, something transcendent to the moment that he's facing, squaring off there in Tiananmen Square. He's able to stand tall in front of that tank because something captured his awe. Something captured his heart. Something captured his imagination and caused him to say, I know of something. I believe in something that is bigger and greater and grander than this small little column of tanks. So, as Jared just said a moment ago, tonight is our final week of 2018, and being our final week and being kind of the, the wrap-up of the year, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on my life and our church and all that's been going on and some things that have been going on in my personal life, and uh, I want to be a little bit more vulnerable with you tonight. And let me begin this vulnerability by saying this. I don't know about you, but I am glad that 2018 is almost over, all right? Yeah, we can applaud for that. Uh, I'm not a negative person, I'm not a cynical person, uh, but it has been a tough year. It has been a tough year, not just for our church, which has been a very tough year, probably the toughest year in our 40 plus year history, but like many of you, um, we've had tough things go on in our personal lives as well that get layered on top of the challenges in this church that we love, and I'm certainly no exception to that. This has been a tough year in my life personally. So if I'm fully honest, I'm ready for a turn of the year. I'm ready for a fresh chapter in our church's history. I'm ready for a fresh chapter in my own story. Um, but as we move to the close of this year and the beginning of a new year, I want to be certain we carry this question with us. What do we see? What is it that captures our attention? What is it that captures our imagination? What are we looking at? Are we just looking at the circumstances that are right before us? Or do we see something bigger? Do we see something that transcends the moment? What is it that inspires us? What is it that captured us, captures us? What is it that motivates us to stand up and stand tall despite what's going on around us? I'm convinced that available to us is a bigger, grander, more powerful, more awe-inspiring vision than whatever circumstances we're facing in our lives. 
give you my confession, though. I don't find it easy to remember that. It's challenging for me to cultivate that in my own life. It's easier for me to get caught up in the moment and just see the, the tanks, so to speak, in front of me. My wife and I just took a few days together. We went up uh, to Wisconsin together, literally just came back yesterday. And um, as we do on trips like that, we got into some long conversations and some really good conversations. And I noticed something the more we talked and the more we processed and the more we kind of looked at this past year and all that's going on in our lives and in our church, and I realized that we were gaining an increased vision through that conversation. We were seeing something bigger and something grander and something greater than just what was in front of us in that moment. And it inspired us. It increased our peace. It increased our joy. It was a good exercise for us. But that, that's not typically my default. I don't just go there automatically. I have to fight for that. It's a little more challenging for me. So here at Midweek in this Awestruck series, we've been addressing what it's like to follow the Holy Spirit, to experience God's presence in one's life. What's it like to have God's presence in your life? How do we respond to the Holy Spirit? How do we, how do we respond to His orchestration and His sovereignty in our life? Now, uh, my answer to this question, it will be forever different because of 2018. And I want to do my best to kind of navigate that with you and tell you a little bit about how that's worked for me. I've shared before with you that I, I carry these uh, little cards with me. They have passages on them and prayers on them and different things I can pull out to kind of keep me grounded. I actually had this packet of cards on an airplane recently, and I accidentally left it on the airplane. So this is my new packet of cards. Uh, but it's not a problem because I, I go through them so much that they're, they're pretty much ingrained in me. But I still like the cards. I've got one particular card I want to get to tonight, uh, a card that has been reverberating in my soul quite a bit in recent weeks, in recent months. But in order to get there, I need to give you some context. And so I'm going to work that way toward the end of our time. And actually, I need help from a friend. I need help from a guy named Joseph. Many of you know the story of Joseph. It will be new to some of you, but I suspect many of you know the story of Joseph uh, we talk about him around here from time to time. Uh, the story of Joseph, it gets off to a pretty rough start. Uh, you'll remember that Joseph was the kid brother. There are 12 brothers, sons of Israel. He wasn't the youngest. Benjamin was the youngest, but he was the second to youngest. And when you're the second to youngest in a tribe of 12, 12 different brothers, you're the kid brother, right? You get knocked around a lot. Not only is he the kid brother, though, Joseph is also dad's favorite, right? Dad does special things for Joseph. He gets him a colorful coat. Maybe you've seen the musical, Joseph and the Technicolor Dream Coat, right? He gets this beautiful, colorful coat given to him from his dad. None of the others got this coat. This would be kind of like they all had to buy their own cars, and up pulls Joseph in his bright, shiny red sports coat, right, that dad bought for him. This doesn't go over too well with the brothers, then, to make matters worse, Joseph has a couple of dreams. Not just normal dreams, not the kind of dreams that you, you had last night and you kind of forget what they were, kind of foggy dreams. These are like vivid dreams, like watching a movie or something. And Joseph, rather than keeping these dreams to himself, he tells them to his brothers. I'll give you one example. Genesis 37, 9 says this. He says, listen, speaking to his brothers, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and 11 stars, they bowed low before me. Now, it didn't take long for Joseph's brothers to figure out what this dream is about. The sun and the moon, that'd be mom and dad. The 11 stars, that'd be the 11 other brothers. They all bow down in front of Joseph. And they hear this and they think, seriously? You, know, you think that your family, that all of us, are one day going to bow down to you like you're going to be our ruler? A wiser, older Joseph might have kept this dream to himself, but Joseph was young and brash, and he lets his brothers in on the dreams. Their response is predictable, Genesis 37. So you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. This is sibling rivalry to the nth degree, right? This is like irritating little brother 
who is dad's favorite son and God's doing something to speak into him and it's going to his head and he has all these big thoughts like we've got to do something about little Joey. This, this is not going well. And so Joseph's brothers, they, they do something. Their irritation turns to literal anger and rage and they grab him and they rip the coat from him and they slaughter a goat or a calf or something. They spill blood all over the coat and they throw Joseph in a pit. They ultimately sell him to the Ishmaelites into slavery. The Ishmaelites drag him off to another land. They go back to the, bro- to the dad and say, Dad, look, we found Joseph's coat. And Joseph is presumed dead. And he grieves. Now, pause the story right there for a moment. Scene one, you're Joseph. Joseph, you're going places. You're, you're special, Joseph. You're unique, Joseph. You get these dreams, Joseph. You're going to be a leader, Joseph. You're going to rule, Joseph. Got big plans for you, Joseph. That's scene one. Scene two, you're shackled at the wrists. You're shackled at the legs. You're scooting along, being marched off to a foreign land to be a slave there. You have to wonder if those dreams mocked him in that moment. Seriously, God? I thought I was going to be a leader. I thought I was going to be a ruler. I thought my family... My brothers would bow down to me. They didn't bow down to me. They just nearly killed me. Now my dad thinks I'm dead. The scriptures don't record what passed through young Joseph's mind, but I have to think that something like that had to be going on inside of him. Genesis 39 then gives us the spark notes for the journey to Egypt. As I read this, I want you to listen for something that's a little bit odd in this. The last phrase, Genesis 39, 1 through 2 says this, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Then this, the Lord was with Joseph. Anything strike you odd about that? The Lord was with Joseph. Think about that for a moment. The Lord was with Joseph. Question for you, what's it look like when God is with you? What happens in your life? There's not any template per se, but we can look at a few stellar examples in Scripture, and Joseph is one of them. God was with Joseph, and Joseph was robbed of his very life and sold into slavery. And yet we get this tagline, and it comes up repeatedly, God was with Joseph. I have to imagine, Joseph has the thought, God is with me, and he has to think, hey God, if this is what it's like for you to be with me, would you mind going and spending a little time with my brothers, right? Like, this is not... This is not what I had in mind. This is not what I envisioned a God-saturated life would be like. What's it like to follow God? What's it like to respond to His Spirit? What's it like having God's sovereignty over your life? The next scene in the story reveals the condition of young Joseph's heart. A woman crosses paths with Joseph. Unfortunately, it's Potiphar's wife. Yes, on a multiple occasion, this wife of his now master attempts to seduce Joseph. Now, I want you to think for a moment and consider what's going on. Joseph is a young man. His prospects for marriage would be pretty much nil at this point, right? He's living in a foreign land as a slave. His life has pretty much unraveled. I have to wonder if he might be thinking, you know, God, like, what do I have to lose? My life is pretty much all beat to heck here. Like, I might as well enjoy myself a little bit. I might as well indulge a little bit, right? He had physical needs. He had urges. God certainly seems to have let his life unravel. Clearly, God doesn't have any interest in me. Listen closely, though, to how Joseph handles the situation. Hear what he says to Potiphar's wife. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. I love this courage of Joseph. How could I sin against God? Look how good he's been to me, right? What's going on in this man's life? What perspective does he have? Let's bring up unknown rebel again. I ask, what does he see? What's his vision? He sees something beyond the tank. He sees something bigger and more important than the immediate. He's in awe of something. Joseph sees something too. Joseph sees something bigger and grander and greater than the challenges that are before him. He had to have. It was essential for his well-being. If he didn't have that bigger vision, he would have crumbled, he would have caved in those moments. But he didn't. 
He saw something bigger. Well, Mrs. Potiphar didn't take too kindly to Joseph's continued refusal. Ultimately, she's so offended and bothered that she takes action herself. Joseph is doing his work, and she makes an advance toward him. Scripture records what happens. She caught Joseph by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Mrs. Potiphar then keeps the cloak, and she holds it as evidence. And when her husband comes home, she says, that, that uh, slave you bought, he tried to make sport of me. Look, I have his cloak here as evidence. This, of course, infuriates Potiphar, and Scripture records the result. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph, this man envisioned by God for greatness, is framed now for attempted rape. That's what's going on in his life. Joseph, you've been so good. You've been so faithful. You've been so true. You follow me. You follow my spirit. Let's get you out of the slavery situation. How's prison sound? How's that sound now? Now, again, most wouldn't blame Joseph for tipping toward the cynical side or the jaded side of life at this point. This faith stuff, this God stuff, it hasn't exactly sent me to the top. He gave me this vision, and all that vision does is mock me now. Look where I am. Now I'm in jail. But it's fascinating to read what actually does happen in Joseph's life. Genesis 39, verse 20. But while Joseph was there in prison, again, this phrase, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he, made, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord is with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Fascinating commentary on Joseph's life. This guy's in prison, but in the midst of this, God grants him his favor and makes his presence known to him. There had to be some wrestling going on here. Joseph maintains his faith. Joseph stays true to God. How does he do this? The only way one does this is if there's a bigger picture, a bigger vision, a bigger conviction about what's really going on than the immediate circumstances that he's squaring off with in that moment. One day the prison door is open. A man walks in. He's called the cupbearer, the cupbearer to the king. And he's somehow offended the king and he's thrown into prison. And he has this dream or a couple of dreams, and he's, he's wanting to know what's going to happen. He, he needs interpretation from these dreams. Now, uh, at this point, Joseph smells opportunity, all right? Because he, he has understanding of dreams. God is with him, and so he go, goes to the cupbearer and says, you know, God is the interpreter of dreams. Tell me your dreams, and maybe I can help you. And so he tells him his dreams, and, and Joseph says, I, I know the answer to the dreams. In three days, you're going to be restored to your position. You're going to be you're going to be out of position, or out of prison here. So at this point, Joseph smells opportunity. The cupbearer would be free in three days. The cupbearer would be with Pharaoh in three days. The cupbearer would have the ear of the man, of the king. He could talk to him. And so Joseph takes advantage of this opportunity. Mr. Cupbearer, um, you need to understand my story. I've been framed. I've been misled. I was sold into slavery. I was I was then uh, uh, framed for rape. I, I'm, I'm in this prison. I really haven't done anything wrong. Could you per, put a word in for me with the king? And the cupbearer agrees to it. He, he agrees to do that. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. You think about those moments in your life when you go, okay, this is my big break. God, all you have to do is this one little thing. There's this one little thing you have to do. You just have to get little Mr. Cupbearer boy to remember to say something to the king, right? That's, that's all that's got to happen here, and I'll be freed. It's, this is not a big ass. This isn't like a, a moving of a mountains kind of a thing here, God. Just, can you just do this one thing and inspire the cupbearer to do that? But God doesn't answer that prayer. God says no to that prayer, and the cupbearer forgets. Your hopes soar, your hopes dash. Genesis 40, 23. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Now, think about this with me for a moment. Truth is, God could have answered this prayer. God could have reminded the cupbearer to do so. 
But when this story goes on, I want you to keep in mind what would Joseph had missed had God answered that prayer and the cupbearer remembered. God still had a plan. God was still working something out. It seemed so clear. It seemed so orchestrated. It seemed so divine. And yet it wouldn't be realized in that moment. Scripture tells us that two years passed. Genesis 40.23 talks about how the cupbearers freed. Uh, the chief cupbearer, whoever, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And then Genesis 41, verse 1. When two full years had passed... Pharaoh had a dream. Now, this is interesting. Pharaoh has a dream, and he's talking about this dream, and all of a sudden now, cupbearer guy, he remembers his, his cellmate back in prison. Pharaoh is, is frustrated because he can't get his dream interpreted, and finally, the cupbearer goes to him and says, um, you know, forgive me, but I just remembered something I should have remembered long ago. Uh, there's this guy in prison, and he interpreted a dream of mine, and it worked. It came true. I was restored to my position with you. This is Pharaoh's uh, uh, incident, and this is Joseph's opportunity. Genesis 41, 14, Joseph is summoned, and this is what it says. When Joseph had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. I love this little verse. When Joseph had shaved and changed his clothes, he comes before Pharaoh. It's it's, it's just a little commentary on what happened, but I want you to picture like scene one, ragged, homeless looking prisoner guy, scene two, standing before the most powerful man in the world. In an instant, his life has changed and he's ready for it. So uh, what do you do in this moment? What do you do when now you've got your shot? You're going to stand before the king. You're going to stand before the pharaoh, the, the one who could change everything in your life. You know, you're in this situation. This is one of those situations where you want to impress this guy. You want to tell this guy you're capable. What, ha what happens here is fascinating. It's very revealing of Joseph's heart because Pharaoh says to, to Joseph, are you able to interpret my dreams? Listen to what he says, Genesis 41, 16. I cannot do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. What a statement. What, what a revelation of Joseph's heart and what's been being shaped and molded in his heart all of these years. Joseph is a humble man. He's a broken man, and he understands, hey, it's not me. It's not my power. It's not my smarts that interprets this dream. This dream. Uh, I have a conversation with the God of the universe, and if he wants to reveal this dream to you, he'll reveal this dream to you. No, let's not forget the God whom Joseph is in awe of. This is the God who would allow Joseph's family to betray him. This is the God who would allow Joseph to be framed for rape. This is the God who allowed Joseph to be thrown into prison, and yet still in the midst of all of this, Joseph is in awe of his God. Joseph understands that his God has been present in all of this, and his God has a plan, and he's working something out. He's orchestrating something, and he wants to follow this God. He wants to respond to his spirit. He wants to be a child of this God. Pharaoh tells Joseph his two dreams. Joseph tells him that the dreams foretell of seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. God's going to give you a heads up here, Pharaoh, about what's going to happen. There's going to be a horrible famine. You need to be real careful because there's going to be a, a, a big harvest, seven years. Then there's going to be a horrible famine. You need to be real careful that you don't squander that harvest. You need to be ready for that famine. Joseph tells him all this. He then tells Pharaoh what he must do. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. You can almost see Joseph doing this, right? You know, who do you know who's discerning? Joseph knows dummy. He's applying for a job, right? Right there, fresh out of, out of prison. Now you have to think, that's a bold move. What's your resume, Joseph? I don't really have one. I, you know, I've, I've been a prisoner. I've been a slave. I'm, I'm a convict. And yet Joseph is effectively applying to be second in command for the whole Egyptian world right there. Where does he get his confidence? Where does he get that kind of gumption? I have to believe it's that one little phrase. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with Joseph. If the Lord can be with Joseph when he's wallowing in prison, the Lord can be Joseph when he's leading a nation. 
The Lord can take care of both extremes, and Joseph knows this well, and so he, he acts boldly. Genesis 41, 39, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater to you. To which Joseph responds, My thoughts exactly. It's not actually in Scripture, but I know that's what he said. Years ago, as a college student, I was listening to Louis Giglio speak, and he made a statement I'll never forget. He said, if God's going to take you from A to C, you rarely go through B. God has this way, this serpentine way of, of getting you exactly where you need to be. Joseph has this dream, I'm going to be a leader, I'm going to be a leader in this land, and he plots it out, I'll get my degree, then I'll get my MBA, maybe I'll get a PhD, I'll get some leadership training, I'll be ready for this. God says, no, that's not what's going to prepare you for leadership. What's going to prepare you for leadership is humility. What's going to pre prepare you for leadership is being broken. What's going to prepare you for leadership is recognizing that the only one who puts you in leadership is me. And so I got this path I want you to take, and all along this path, I want you to recognize who's in charge here, who's sovereign here. I want you to see the big picture here in the midst of this trying circumstances. Don't look at what's staring you down, the evil that's before you. Look at me, Joseph. There's a bigger picture here. If you're going to lead, you've got to know that. That's how this is going to work. Years later, Joseph's brothers travel to Egypt, the land where, unknown to them, their brother, whom they betrayed, is now the ruling authority, second only to Pharaoh. And they come to him because they're starving to death. They need food, and they hear that there's food in Egypt. They go before their brother. Joseph knows it's them, and they don't know it's Joseph. And it's at this point that Joseph's humanity shines through brilliantly. Now, without revealing his identity, we read this, Genesis 42. So Joseph put them all in prison for three days. Probably the very prison that he had been in before. Now you have to wonder what's going on during these three days. What sort of wrestling is going on in Joseph's soul? These are the men who have and, you know, caused so much pain in his life. What do I do now, God? Joseph is wrestling. How do I handle this? What would you have me do, God? Ultimately, Joseph devises a scheme. Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin, is not with him, and he loves Benjamin. He's longed for Benjamin for many years. And so without revealing his identity, he tells his brothers, leave one of you in prison, travel back to your dad that you talked about, and then get Benjamin, your youngest brother, bring him back, and I'll know then that you weren't spies spying out our land. And so they do this. They take Simeon and put him in prison, and they leave to go get Benjamin. In time, they return with Benjamin, but I have to wonder what happened during their absence. Again, Simeon's in prison. His brothers are gone. There's a considerable amount of time to walk from, from Egypt back to Israel and back, and actually stayed in Israel for a while, um, a year maybe. I don't know how long. You have to wonder, what, what's Joseph processing at this time? What's he thinking? What are, what are the conversations he's having with his God. There's pain here that he's dealing with, some very real pain. I don't know if I can do this, God. I don't know if I, if I can get past this. And yet, God, I see it. You did have a plan. You were working something out here. You, they, they didn't know what was going on here, but your sovereignty brought me here to save lives. You were working something out that is bigger than their little motions and such and the plans that they had. Your plans ruled, God. You can see him kind of going back and forth between these things. When the brothers return, Joseph attempts a scheme to get Benjamin away from his brothers. He fills all their sacks with grain, and he has his servants put his silver goblet in Benjamin's sack. They then all leave. All the brothers leave. Then he sends his soldiers to go after them. They open up the sacks, and lo and behold, there's Joseph's goblet. Benjamin has stolen all the excuse he needs to bring Benjamin back and send the brothers away. He'd get his brother, and he could leave the ones he doesn't like, the ones he, he struggles with deeply. The brothers are hauled back before Joseph, and Judah does the unthinkable. He offers to be sent into slavery on behalf of his brother Joseph. So please, my Lord, he says, Genesis 44, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. And with this act of kindness... Joseph breaks, and he tells who he is. Genesis 45, verse 4. 
And this is the verse I carry with me on my card. Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been a famine in the land, and for the next five years there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. God had a plan. God was doing something. Joseph did something profound. Joseph leaned into the bigger picture. Joseph saw the bigger vision. Yes, by following God and being true to God and being true to His Spirit, it led him in this chaotic course in his life that didn't make sense, that was confusing at times, but he sensed God's presence all along, and ultimately it made one sense, and it made sense in the profoundest of ways. It got explained in a way that he realized God was preparing him and leading to him to a place where he would save literally millions of lives. He would be used in a strong and mighty way. He could see this big view of God, this sovereign view of God, and it empowered him to give grace to the immediate problems that had been caused so deeply by his brothers. Last week on Monday, I woke up and just full confession, my wires were kind of crossed internally. I woke up in a bit of a funk. actually woke up very early. And I got up and I went downstairs, and uh, when I get in that kind of funk, I just have to pray. And so uh, I just started praying and just started talking to God, and, and I came into this thought that was helpful. I said, God, you know what I need? Like, I know the truths. I, I know the scriptures. I, I know things like the story of Joseph. I, I know the verses. I know you're sovereign, all that. I just need to hear from you uniquely today. I need, like, a personalized thing today. You don't have to say yes, but, like, some of these truths I'm gripping on and they're kind of slipping out of my hands, and I'm trying to stand strong in the midst of all this, but, you know, we've had a heck of a year with our church, and there's been challenges in my own life and all this, God, and I just, I feel kind of beat up and uh, was just in kind of one of those places. So I actually went back to bed for a little bit, got back up, and a couple hours later I was at the gym, pulled into the gym parking lot where uh, I work out and I'm getting out of my car. And I have this thought. I, I, I kind of looked behind me at the roads. And I thought, you know, I, I think I, I should go for a run today instead of go to the gym. And then I realized how cold it was. And I thought, no, that's not a good idea. And so <laughs> I went into the gym and I went downstairs to the locker room and I changed my clothes and came back up and got on one of those miserable elliptical machines that don't go anywhere. And I'm, I'm starting this elliptical machine, and I'm talking to God, and I realize, you know what? I really do need to get outside. I just need, like, wide open spaces because I need to have a real honest conversation with God. And if I do that here on this elliptical machine, people will think I'm weird. <laughs> and so I, I uh, went back downstairs, went out to my car, and I, I got a uh, hat and gloves on, and I, I start doing my thing, uh, running up a street. Actually, running is a very optimistic word. I'm kind of plodding along on the street. And I repeat my prayer from earlier. God, I just need to hear from you. I know the truth. I know you're with me. But, like, I need to feel your presence. There's just, you know, a lot. I feel knocked around a lot. And I just, I need to know that you're with me. I I can't quite get a grip on these things. So I'm running through Barrington. I turn here and I turn there. and Going down this road and off to my right, I see, like, a historical marker. And I never noticed it before. And I don't really care about it, but I slow down enough, and I look at it, and it says, like, Barrington Campground or something. I was like, oh, this must be Boy Scouts or something back in the day or whatever. Then I get a little closer, and uh, I read it, and it says that on this spot, this 17 acres, uh, for about 100 years, up until 1974, evangelical churches in the area would gather together, and they built a tabernacle that seat, uh, would seat 1,200 people. And they'd hold services on these 17 acres. Uh, and they did this for like 100 years. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's, I never knew this. This, this happened. Maybe some of you know about this. And so I, I walk a little closer. I'm looking at this. And I'm looking at this land, these trees and such. And then, then I look at uh, the top of this. It's on this stone. 
like a big rock, and this plaque's mounted on. And I look on the top of this stone, and it looks like there's something under the snow. It had been snowing that day. The other something else. And I wipe it away, and I kid you not, on this plaque it said, God is faithful. And I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. I've been asking you to, like, give me a sign today. And I thought, I should go for a run. I don't do that in downtown Barrington. I don't live in downtown Barrington. And you led me to a plaque that says, God is faithful. Those dots were just close enough to each other that I took it to heart. I said, God, I think, I think maybe you're speaking to me. And I looked closer on this rock, and it was actually etched kind of like a tombstone. Etched was the word uh, Amana. And I actually have the uh, plaque coming up on the screen behind me. It says Amana. Uh, God is faithful. And that, that word Amana is Hebrew, meaning God is faithful. I, I looked it up, tried to uh, study. It's actually used only one time in the Old Testament, and it was a little difficult to get uh, the language history of it. My suspicion, it has something to do with manna and how God provided manna in the wilderness. I might be wrong about that, but I looked at this plaque, and I realized somewhere over the last 100 years, my brothers and sisters in Christ wanted to etch in stone God's faithfulness. They wanted to send a reminder to future generations, God is faithful. They wanted to send that reminder because it doesn't always feel that way. It doesn't always feel like God is faithful when you get the twists and the turns and the ups and the downs of life. Uh, you need those reminders. You need those signs. You need those stories of Joseph. You need those, those signs and those plaques on the wall that, that say, you know, you got to remember this Amana. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is, God is with you. Friends, what's it look like to follow God, to respond to God's Spirit? I'd say it like this. It's a wonderful thing if, like Joseph, we cultivate awe for the greatness of God, and it's a miserable thing if we let God stay small. It's an awesome thing if we follow God and God is big and glorious and mighty. It's a terrible thing if God is small. Because when we follow God, it's a challenging thing to do in this world. And there are twists and there are turns and there are ups and there are downs and there are challenges. Jesus said to expect it. He said, you know, keep in mind, if they hated me first, they're going to hate you too. Keep in mind, you're going to experience challenges in this world. You're going to experience the ups and downs and the twists and the turns. Keep that in mind. What's he telling you? Keep a big vision here. Keep a big picture here. Let God be sovereign here. He's got a plan. He's orchestrating something. He's working something out. 2018, it's going to make sense someday. There's going to be purpose in this. I asked a question, what do you see? What do you see? Unknown rebel, he saw something bigger than the tank that stood before him. The result, in 1998, Time Magazine named Unknown Rebel one of the, most, one of the hundred most influential people of the 20th century. He was listed alongside Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, Franklin Roosevelt, Bart Simpson, <laughs> others... And I don't know of his faith, but I do know that God used him to change the, change the world. And God did so because he had a bigger vision. He had a bigger view of things, a view that transcended the realities that be, were before him. So let me say it again. What's it look like to follow God, to respond to God's presence? It's a wonderful thing if, like Joseph, we cultivate awe for the greatness of God. It's a miserable thing if we let God stay small. But if we see God more of who he is, if we see his grandeur and his greatness and his sovereignty and his love and his justice and his orchestration of all things in this world, then we too can stand back and say, what a God. What a God we have. And we can say, I don't really know what makes sense right now. I just know that it does. Somehow it's going to make sense. God has a plan. Aman, God is faithful. He's up to something here. He's doing something here. He's doing something in our church. He's doing something in each of your individual's lives. He's up to something. We can take that to the bank. We can take that when the twists and turns get the best of us. God has a plan. He's working something out. He's up to something. And yes, following him may take us through some challenges. But if we stay faithful, we will see God's up to something. And that something is exceedingly and exceptionally good. Let's pray together. Father God, we just as a community right now, 
as individuals and as a community, we want to stay. We want to say, we trust you. In the midst of a challenging year, we trust you. In the midst of individual challenges we all face, we trust you. And God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room who may have a hard time saying that right now with authenticity. God, give us each the grace to see that and to experience that and to know that and to believe that in our heart of hearts. Help us to know that you have a plan, that you are faithful, that you are good, that you are trustworthy, that you are sovereign, that you transcend all things. Help us to believe in you right now and to celebrate you and worship you not just because of what you're doing, but because of who you are, and we can trust in who you are. You are faithful. We look to you for this guy. We trust you for this guy. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
God, that we would remain in awe of your power, of your strength. And that daily you would give us small reminders. Whether it's physically going on a run and uncovering a rock that we've never seen. Things that remind us of your faithfulness. Give us little reminders. Give us little Ebenezer's little stones of help, little things that take us back to the places where we were in our minds, where you came through for us. God, I pray that you would cover each person as we leave this place. Help us to remain in your presence. Help us to grow deeper and closer to you. Help us to remember Jesus, that you are Emmanuel, you are God with us, and your promise is to be with us to the end of the age. It's our prayer with thanksgiving in Christ's name, and everybody say, amen, amen. God bless you, folks. It's been so good to be with you every week or just about every week in 2018, and I'm sorry that it has to come to a close for our midweek community, but we will see you back on January 9th, Wednesday, January 9th at midweek. Go in peace.